Hi, everybody. Welcome to Studio Bridge, our first month, our first uh, night in uh, November. And uh, November, we are lucky to have the great Chris Payne. Chris, say hi. How do you do? How do you do? We are. Um, uh, this is this is a, a, a big one for me. Um, Chris and I were just going over some facts, uh, some things that I uh, have been part of my life since I was 15 years old. And I met Chris when he was studying with my father and the group of artists with the Illustrators Workshop. And actually, I think we were, we were joking about hitting tennis balls together when I was 15 years old. Um, Chris, we're still doing the same things. We're still playing tennis. We're still drawing pictures. Uh, uh, I hadn't started yet, but you were, uh, you were well on your way. Um, I pulled a few, a few images here. Uh, this was actually a piece that uh, my father had traded with Chris. Um, and I just, it's remarkable. And, and it, it's, it's, it's a beautiful illustration. It's beautifully drawn, beautifully painted and just so to the point and so funny. Um, absolutely, absolutely love it. Um, there's a few others I want to show, but I'm going to, I'm going to say this. Chris is one of the, I can't think of anybody else. I, I need to do the research on it, but I don't know if there's anybody in the history of American illustration that has won the Hamilton King Award, that has multiple gold and silver medals from the Society of Illustrators, that has um, won the Sting Distinguished Edu Educators Award and has been inducted into the Hall of Fame at the Society of Illustrators. If, if I'm wrong, it's only, it's gotta be one or two other individuals if, that, if that's the case, but I, ca I can't think of any and, and of any that would fit that bill. Um, uh, Chris is one, as I said, one, you know, done everything as an illustrator and has won multiple awards from the Cartoonist Society. Um, he's also been an educator for a very, very long time. And um, I'm very fortunate that he has always kind of bought into what I'm doing and has taught, um, most importantly to me as an educator, has, has taught with the Illustration Academy since the beginning and never missed it. Um, 27 years in a row. Uh, which just absolutely blows my mind. Uh, currently, Chris is the uh, chair at the Hartford Art School uh, for their MFA program. And if you are interested in an MFA, there was only one I would recommend, and it is, is Mr. Payne's program. So, Chris, uh, I'm going to flip through, and uh, I'm going to let you, I know you're going to share a bunch of other pieces, but I cannot not do this because this is so important to me. I mean, the imagery, it goes all over the place. Um, I'm pretty proud of this one. Uh, <laughs> my, my most recent uh, uh, acquisition. Um, but I abs absolutely love, love the work and the range from book, from children's book to magazine cover to advertisement. Um, it's, it's just amazing at the ground that he's covered. Um, something I wanted to point out, I put this one in there specifically, and, well, and Chris is going to show so much work, but the landscapes in his paintings are so good. I just hope he never just takes off and just does pure landscape all the time. <laughs> um, but he could. Uh, he certainly would. Um, but anyway, um, Chris, uh, I've shown enough. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing and you grab the share okay. uh, just, and uh, we'll get going. Oh my, I got to, we got to go back. We didn't do this right. There you go. You got it. We got to start there. That's where we're supposed to. Okay. Yeah. You left <laughs> off on a, a photo of yourself. Yeah. Well, we were talking with uh, with Timmy yeah. about that. Well, uh, just just go back to the, you know, at the beginning, just hit play and you're, you're yeah. good. So let's hit uh, play. And so, like uh, John said, let's start at the beginning. So, again, uh, I was born, though, in 1954. Um, I guess to give it a little historical context, uh, 
I was born in Cincinnati, Ohio, lived most of my life in Cincinnati. And uh, apart from uh, being an artist, the only other thing I wanted to do was be a baseball player. And that was my, that's about as far as I got in baseball right there. Uh, just to get put again, a little context in it, in 1954, Dwight Eisenhower was president of the United States. Uh, it was only nine years uh, after World War II that I was born, 10 years before the Beatles landed in uh, New York and 15 years before Neil Armstrong walked on the moon and the uh, rock concert Woodstock took place. Um, in 1954, On the Waterfront won the Academy Award Elvis Presley recorded That's All Right. Uh, Joe McCarthy uh, was formerly censored and Brown versus Board of Education was decided. On television, Father Knows Best, Lassie and the Magical World of Disney were on TV and Willie Mays made that incredible catch in the 1954 World Series. So that, could, that kind of puts the timeline of kind of when I was born. Um, I was, as I say, I was born in Ohio, and you'd be surprised how many really great artists are from uh, from Ohio. Uh, I'd like to be able to think I'm as good, good but uh, I just hang in there. Uh, but the, you, you'd be surprised. Uh, people think of Ohio as kind of flyover country because it's kind of in the Midwest. But uh, that's a tough crowd. <laughs> I know. Look at that. That is murderers row. I mean, that's some pretty solid people. And you look at the great, and some of them are, were real innovators. Richard Alcult, he created the early newspapers that gave us the Yellow Kid and Hogan's Alley, Coles Phillips with the uh, Fadeaway Girl, um, Milton Kniff, he was, he's oftentimes referred to as the Rembrandt of uh, comics. As a matter of fact, in Columbus, Ohio, we're home to the Billy Ireland Cartoon Museum, which is the best cartoon museum in the world. Um, contemporary artists like Brad Holland, John Palancar are real innovators in illustration and some of the best. And of course, Bob Heindel is on the list and he was part of the uh, illustrators workshop that I attended with uh, John's father, Mark English. And we'll talk about that later, but there's some great, great artists on there. And just most recently, the guy that down at the bottom there on the right, I just found out Jim Flora was from Bell Fountain, Ohio. And he too went to the Art Academy of Cincinnati. So some real great artists there. Uh, when I was a kid, uh, probably this is the children's book that was most impactful for me. Mike Mulligan and a Steam Shovel by Virginia Lee Burton. Story and Pictures by Virginia Lee Burton. And, you know, I just loved the book. I loved, it. I, th I think part of it was the house that I, was in as a very young child near us, there were other houses being built and there were, you know, backhoes and bulldozers and, and, and things of that nature. So I think that that's what kind of connected me to this book about the steam shovel. And so I just love those things. And I, and I would draw them. This was even before kindergarten. Um, for most of you guys who are watching this, um, I, I think most of us, find our love for art and illustration in the pop culture we grew up with. So for me, growing up at that time, uh, watching Disney movies uh, was a huge factor. And like I said, you know, the wonderful world of Disney was on TV. So Disney animation was something very impactful, along with the Warner Brothers and Tex Avery cartoons and the wild characteristics, those uh, cartoons took place. I mean, they were totally entertaining and quite fun, and we loved them. Uh, as I got a little bit older, um, I really got into Spider-Man, uh, the comics, particularly Spider-Man drawn by Steve Ditko. And I remember this particular issue was huge for me. I mean, the, the drawing of Spider-Man lifting that desk up over his head, the full page image, I don't know how many times I drew that picture imitating that that picture the water eh, that was not as big but it was just the the anatomy and just the that perspective of lifting that the dy dynamic nature of that picture was so impactful and i i would i drew it all the time and i love the way steve ditko drew spider-man um i get a little bit older and i'm introduced to mad magazine mad magazine at that time you know it was a, a humor magazine it was a uh, kind of 
spun out of the EC creepy uh, comics that were a little bit before my time. You know, I was much more into Mad Magazine, which had the great artists like Jack Davis and Mort Drucker and many others, because there was no photography in, in the magazine. It was all illustration and it was just all terrific illustration. So I love that stuff. Other artists as I got older, you know, Rockwell I discovered and my parents always had uh, National Geographic and Tom Lovell was a, was a featured artist often in National Geographic and his pictures were just so dynamic. I mean, a lot of them were illustrations such as, uh, you know, the Battle of Hastings or something like that that just had hundreds and hundreds of people, you know, um, uh, Alexander the Great, things of that nature. But this, this one I remember was so impactful about this uh, incident where they were uh, doing altitude flying in balloons, seeing how far they could push the altitude and the uh, balloon broke away and it was plummeting to earth and the guys were trying to get out of it. And one guy got stuck. And the only way for the guy to get out was the, putting his foot on his chest to help him out. And then they took the parachutes down and made it to safety. But it was, you know, that's a pretty frightening image right there. Um, and then I didn't know the, um, who the artist was at that time uh, doing like this particular movie poster, The Attack of the 50 Foot Woman. But we were all into those kind of you know, uh, movies about, you know, giant caterpillars and praying mantis and tarantulas and other radioactive creatures that were uh, terrorizing the planet at the time. But I later on found out the artist's name was Randall Brown, who did a ton of those. But he also did like um, uh, Ben-Hur and uh, the Alamo movie posters. But he was a very successful illustrator who worked for, uh, from California, who worked for many of the magazines early on, like Argosy and, and the like. But it was through an association that he met uh, uh, that got him doing a lot of the movie posters, particularly in the... Uh, 50s and into the early 60s but his stuff was absolutely fantastic and very very fun to look at I remember those very vividly um, and I graduated from high school in 1972 uh, and went to Miami University um, when I think back to my high school years um, you know I did take art classes but I was never part of the art club our school had an art club I, I never did it I, I was just kind of doing my own thing really you know, making up comic books, doing my own pictures of, you know, baseball and football and whatever I wanted to do. Um, the art teachers that I had in high school, I wouldn't say were, were great art teachers. One of them was more of an arts and crafts teacher dealing with things like jewelry making and what have you. And the other one, I, I really didn't understand what she was talking about. And so Chris, did, at that point, did you realize, you know, that these people, these artists were, you know, that was their livelihood. That was how they yeah. were making a living. And you see, that's the deal. That's what I'm getting. That's where I'm going with this is because I didn't have what I called really great art teachers to talk about this stuff. I knew one artist. My dad worked at Gibson greeting cards. He wasn't an artist. He was just an accountant at the place and there was an artist there watercolors by the name of Don Dennis who worked there as an art director. Now Don was a great watercolor uh, landscape artist who would hold workshops in, in Bermuda each summer and would come back with these beautiful watercolors and I, I was very impressed by him. But even so then, you know, I never really thought of or understood a distinction between art that you see in a museum and art that you see in a magazine. They were just all artists, people making pictures. And that's that's all I ever thought. You know, I mean, our, our one teacher was show, I mean, we were we were being shown, you know, Jasper Johns and Hans Hoffman and Jacks and Jackson Pollock and and the likes and Picasso. And you know, that was fine, but I was much more, you know, obviously impressed with the work of narrative artists like Rembrandt and Vermeer. But those artists, Vermeer and Rembrandt, yeah, that's 1600s, and I it's a little bit difficult to relate to the stories of how they made a living being artists back in those days. And so I really, I don't know whether it was because of my lack of curiosity on my own. All I was doing was just drawing and wanting to make pictures. That was it. I wasn't being, in, I wasn't investigating. Like I've got a buddy of mine who, who lives in Columbus. He's a matte painter for Hollywood. 
when he was in high school, I mean, he was already doing the research. He already er knew about Mario Laranaga and the artwork being done for movie making. Uh, and he did the research on his own. He had that kind of curiosity to learn about how do these people do this stuff. I was just looking at it and drawing it there. The, the curiosity level on my part was just simply the making of it, not how do I make a living doing it. Um, but, but I did decide to go to college to study art. And I kind of figured when I went to college, that's where I would learn about it as when I was in college. So I went to Miami University and um, this is kind of the way I drew in high school. Um, this was the very first assignment that I got when I was in college. Uh, the, the, it's what I call the assignment that a teacher will give you to see how high you can jump. They just said, go back to your room, find an object in your room and draw it from three different perspectives and let's see it. It's just all they wanted to see was how well you could draw. Well, this was my catcher's mitt. Like I said, I want to also like baseball. And so I drew my catcher's mitt and brought it back. And this is kind of what I did. And it was there at, in college that I started finding out the distinction between illustration and fine art. And, and of course, at that particular time, uh, one of the chief um, distinctions was that illustration is an art. Oh, that it's illustration, it's not art. And I found that out in one of my drawing classes where uh, the teacher sent us out. It was a beautiful day, said, go outside and draw. I went, okay. So I went over to the ball field and was drawing baseball players on the ball field. And when it came, but when it came time to come back to class the next day, we put our artwork up and the discussion came to my art and he said they weren't good drawings because they looked like illustrations. And I said, I didn't understand that. Uh, I didn't think there was a discussion about illustration or fine art. We were just talking about illustration. So we're not discussing those issues. We're just talking about drawing. So tell me why it's not a good drawing because it looks like an illustration. Okay, we, okay help me go beyond that. Tell me get a little bit further beyond that. And he said, it just looks like an illustration. That was the only reason why it wasn't good. And so unfortunately I was at that time fairly combative and I told him I drew better than he did. And I walked out of the class and he threatened to flunk me. And I told him he couldn't flunk me. The worst he could do is give me a C. And so he gave me a C and that was my one C in art school. <laughs> well and, deserved. <laughs> pardon? Well deserved. Yeah. <laughs> well, when I told him, you know, I drew better than him, I did say two words before that. Um, but, and that's what kind of got me in trouble. But uh, so I found out, okay, well, I don't want to do, because everybody in, in fine art was doing basically kind of abstract expressionism. And that didn't speak to me, you know, I, I wanted to do narrative art. Of course, I didn't call it narrative art. I said, you know, I want to do pictures like you see here, these pictures. And, uh, and of course, at that time too, if you admitted to liking Rockwell, that was like admitting that you were a member of the clan. Um, they, they rock, everybody, everything was do anything, but don't look like Rockwell. He is horrible, he is, he's the worst. And of course I couldn't figure it out. I, I, could, I didn't buy it, I just could not, divorce myself from the craftsmanship that Rockwell brought to his art, um, regardless of whether you agree with the content of his, of the, his pictures. Um, I just thought the craftsmanship was just overwhelming. So I found out about a graphics class, which was graphic design. So I started taking this graphic design class doing stuff like this. And if there was ever design, you know, I would put a picture in it. And, and so, um, the teacher that I had was a member of the art directors club of Dayton. And every now and then he would invite some of the students up to sit in to listen to one of the guest speakers. And he invited me to come up when uh, Alan Cober, I thought I had a picture of Alan Cober's art. Yeah, okay. You do. Yeah. Okay, yeah, oh yeah, I do. Okay, so I eventually got into this class, like I said, the graphic design class and talked about illustration. And the only book that my school had that had anything to do with illustration was this book here, that's image up at the top, which is the Society of Illustrators Annual number 16, which has this collage illustration by Fred Otnes. And 
the only reason why the school had it was because my teacher had it in his office. It was his book. The school didn't have it. He had it. And so I would pour over it with a few of the other classmates that I had in school. And for me, the three dominant figures in that particular annual were Bernie Fuchs, Mark English, and Bart Forbes, Bart Forbes. And so I was just taken by those guys and talked with my teacher a great deal about it. And so that's when he then said, well, here, come up. Uh, this guy is presenting at the Art Directors Club of Dayton now in Coburg. And I saw him give this presentation that was really fantastic. Um, hit all the buttons uh, for me. And after his talk, he mentioned that he and a group of other illustrators were, were starting what was called the Illustrators Workshop. And when he talked about it, I went up to Alan Kober after the discussion and I said, I don't know how I'm gonna do this, but I'm gonna be there. I'm going to come to the Illustrators Workshop. And he said, well, I hope you do. And I, I sold my guitar, I sold my records, I stole, sold my stereo, I sold my comic book collection, I sold my coin collection, I sold my Mad Magazine collection. Every, I mean, every, anything that I could have that I thought had any kind of value, I sold it. You sold, you sold your youth. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I really did. I sold everything to get money. And I still had to borrow like five or $700 from my dad. I mean, my, my, I was one of three in college at that time. So it was, it was, you know, to just go up to mom and dad, say, dad, mom, dad, I want to go to this thing and pay for that too. You know, I, I, so I, I worked all the way and I worked all the way through college. You know, we, we, if we go back real quick, the, these things here, I cooked those things for four years at Miami in the university center. I ate one of them my first year of school and never ate one afterwards because I cooked them for four years. <laughs> uh, they're called toasted rolls. And so I cooked those things, worked all the way through school. And as I say, ended up getting enough money to go to the illustrators workshop where you can see at that time, these, these were kind of the rock stars of illustration. Um, the illustrators that I knew through uh, the uh, Society of Illustrators annual. Uh, Fred Otnes, Bob Peak, Bernie Fuchs, Mark English, Bob Heindel, and Alan Cover. And so I went there and um, it was a fantastic experience. It really was, but it was also um, very eye-opening. Um, I had just graduated from Miami University, so therefore incredibly green. Um, as I said, the uh, program uh, was mostly in the art, was fine art, which was abstract expressionism. The one class was graphic design, and I only had just a little bit of illustration in some of three or four assignments the uh, spring semester of my graduating year. So my, my knowledge of illustration was very limited by the Society of Illustrators annual, that one book, and, and the work that I had done. So when I went to the workshop, you know, I'm there with all these other illustrators. Yeah, there is a handful of young illustrators like me, but there are a lot of seasoned pros there as well. And I would be sitting there listening to them talk about illustration. And, you know, one of them would bring up J.C. Leindecker and they talk about glowingly about J.C. Leindecker. And I would say, who's J.C. Leindecker? And of course, they would look at me like, what? You don't know J.C. Leindecker? And then they'd mention Haddon Sunbloom. What? Who, who's Haddon Sunbloom? You, you don't know Haddon Sunbloom? And so it, it really became very, it was a real cold water slap in the face. What do you call it? I mean, they didn't do it intentionally. It was just something by just being there, you just realized I just realized how incredibly uneducated I was about the world of illustration. And I don't think it was anything intentional by my school. It was, you know, it was just the way it was. And, um, but here I am claiming I want to be an illustrator and, and I know nothing. I mean, I, I know nothing. It's like the only way why I can equate it is like, I want to be a guitar player. And the only guitar player I know is, you know, maybe Eric Clapton. And that's it. Somebody says, what about Jimi Hendrix? You go, I don't know, who's Jimi Hendrix? Oh, yeah, well, what about Jimmy Page? Who's, who's Jimmy Page? 
I mean, it doesn't make any sense. And fortunately, I had enough brains uh, to some degree that I realized that, you know, I, I needed to get to it. And so when I left the workshop, I really thought I failed. Um, as I, I think I've told John before, I mean, I was leaving. I remember driving away and I was crying because I felt I was a failure. But luckily, through the workshop, I was able to get an interview in Akron, Ohio, when I got a job as a studio illustrator. And if you're working in Akron, Ohio, you're drawing pictures of cars and tires. And it was at that studio that we had an art director, a wonderful man by the name of Dick Sefton, who I had long conversations with. And we talked about the very thing I was just saying, how little I felt I knew. And he said, well, if you love Mark English and you love Bernie Fuchs and you love those guys, what you need to do is start looking and studying the people who they, they grew up with, the people that influenced them. And he had these files um, on Kobe Whitmore and Austin Briggs and Joe DeMars and Joe Bowler and all these great illustrators through the you know, 40s, 50s and 60s, going all the way back to people like Peter Helk and Mead Schaefer, and names of artists whose works I never knew, but you could just see kind of where guys like Bernie Fuchs and Mark English were cutting their teeth by seeing the works of these other illustrators who preceded them. And I think that's when I really started to catch um, the bug of wanting to learn about illustration. And so that is a key factor that you know we'll talk about in this particular program and through the assignments. It's what I preach every day for all the years I taught in the undergraduate programs at East Texas State and at Columbus College of Art and Design. And it's what I preach at the Hartford Art School and our MFA program is studying from those who you know precede you and learn from them. Use them as the shoulders of giants that you stand on. So after I, I left Akron, um, I got married. My wife and I moved to Dallas, Texas, where I started freelancing. And that's where I really started to realize that I had to try to find my own voice. As a studio artist, I was kind of doing the job of what the studios wanted. As a freelancer on my own, I had to kind of discover who I was as an illustrator. And that's when I started mixing and trying different mediums. And so this was one of the very first assignments where I was experimenting with oils, acrylics, and pencils. And this was a job I did for the Dallas Times Herald that ran. And one of the pieces that I did for that, this uh, story that ran in the, in the Sunday supplement uh, was the first piece I got in Society of Illustrators. So, I don't want this question to get too far away. Yeah. Uh, so how did, you, how did your parents feel about your, uh, your choice of studying art and illustration? Well, you know, I, my parents were not against it at all. They, they were supportive of it. I think they were apprehensive because, as I said, when I was in high school, I, you know, I wasn't a great student. As a matter of fact, uh, my college, uh, uh, what, do you, what do you call it, your guidance counselor that you would go speak to in, in high school prep, prepping for college. I never talked with her because I thought she was not a pleasant person and not supportive at all. She wasn't supportive of my brother or my sister. Um, and I'm being as nice as I can. <laughs> um, and so I never saw her. And when I applied to Miami, I went up and met the school because they wanted to see my portfolio. And when they looked at my, my uh, grades, um, my transcripts, they said your, my school placement was well below their standards. And I asked them why, what is it? And they gave me the number and it was just, are you, that can't be possible. So I went back to her and I said, you know, what's, can I see my transcripts? And this was, this is 1972. And she said, no, this is at a time, I guess schools did not, if you asked for your transcripts, they didn't have to show them to you. And she refused to show them to me. And she said she would refuse to change what she sent to Miami. So I went to, at that time, the guidance counselor for the incoming freshman, a guy that I knew uh, because I um, 
worked within the athletic department, not as an athlete, but as a manager and um, Paul Champion. And he said, I'll get him. I mean, he was he was a really nice man. He went out and he got him. And sure enough, as I expect, as I concluded, she took my freshman year, sophomore year and junior year, added those three numbers and divided by three and came up with my class placement. Well, if you took my first, my freshman year, that that was the deal breaker right there because that was my probably my most rebellious year as a kid. I was fourth from the bottom of my class. I had, I, my grades were three Ds and two Fs. And somehow they passed me on to sophomore year, but they did. And so my class placement, by the time I graduated, clearly I had moved way up, but that number had held me down. So I asked Paul Champlin, you send all three years up and where I stand my senior year up to Miami so they could see that there was a maturing process. And that's what got me into Miami. So when, when my teacher, uh, I mean, my guidance counselor called me in in May, she goes, I haven't heard from you all year. What are you going to do when you graduate? And I said, well, I applied to Miami. I've been accepted to go to Miami to study art. And she said, you can't go to Miami University. You're not smart enough. They'll flunk you out by the second semester. So isn't that great? You know, yeah. that, have that kind of guidance counseling by, by your, one of your, the people that are supposed to support you. But anyway, so I think my, my parents were apprehensive because they, they saw, is he going to come through? Is he going to follow through? Is he going to do this? And, and I knew that. And that's why I, you know, I got my job freshman year. I mean, I did everything that I could possibly do that I would never, ever call my parents to say, mom, dad, I'm short of some money. Can you get me some money so I can do this? Can I do it? I worked. I saved. Uh, for you know my winter coat, I went to a church rummage sale and bought an old coat up there. I had these old boots. I had these size 15 tennis shoes that I stuck my shoes inside for my winter boots. Because, I mean, everything I did was to, to save money and, and prove to my parents that I could do this, that I wasn't going to be burdening them by my, what I was doing. And so... Um, that's what I did. And I worked all the way through school. And, and that's how all the, and that's why I also, like I said, when I, when I wanted to go to the workshop, I knew my parents couldn't afford it just to pay for me to do it. So that's why I sold everything because it meant everything for me to go to this. You know, I, I I'm going to ask, bring this up again later on, but that had to certainly affect how you, how you see education the other, on the other side now. Um, yeah, uh, the experience of doing that and the experience of having to uh, kind of navigate on your own. Uh, yeah, a, a really um, uh, not well laid out or not a, a path that was very uh, subjective that that, uh, you know, that there the illustration world and you know making a living as an artist is it can be a very subjective thing and you know trying to clarify it for people i mean it's been my kind of my mission for a long time is to help people figure out those that, that you know uh how, how to navigate that uh, and, and 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 that comes down to this whole thing where i start talking about history of illustration and why and when we try to you know when i do my we we do our lectures by the time a student gets through our program they they probably have I reviewed probably at least 300 artists with them from all kinds of disciplines. Because like I said, if you look at my work or your dad's work or Norman Rock, well, we're, you know, there's a certain kind of traditional realism that goes on as your dad advanced and got out of illustration, did more of his fine artwork. It got a much more uh, designed and, you know, texturally oriented and things of that nature. But in the world of illustration, you know, that narrative art has a certain look to a lot of it from Kobe Whitmore and all those guys. And then you come along with people like Jim Flora and Charlie Harper. And it, that's why I'm, I'm trying to, I get those names because to me, that's where a, a young person who's trying to find their voice, trying to find who they are, you know, you, you, you need to, 
expose yourself to all the different kinds of voices that you can have as an illustrator. And I refer to it as for the, our students to try to find what I call their birds of a feather. You know, like, you know, there are all kinds of birds out there. You know, are you a songbird? Are you a hummingbird? Are you, what is it gonna be? And you find those, those artists who support what you wanna do. You may look at Rockwell and say, I love his work, it's beautiful work, but it's nothing like what I want to create, nothing like I want to create. Whereas Grandma Moses, that's the stuff I want to do, things like that. And that's where you end up finding other artists who support that. And, and that's why, you know, we do what we do. And it, it is important that, you know, that you're in the business of not crushing somebody else's dreams you're there to help them find it and, and, and hopefully succeed at it, you know? So, you know, this is, it, it, it was, it was tough, like I said, but like I said, it was, it was a very valuable experience for me to go to the workshop because the one thing it did, it taught me, man, you, you, you don't know this stuff and you need to know it. And once I got to Akron, Dick Sefton really opened my eyes to, all those other people, that's where I learned about Austin Briggs. That's where I learned, because I do remember when I went to the workshop that very first night, the meet and greet that we had there, I went up to each one of the artists and I asked them who were their art heroes. And I remember your dad and Bernie Fuchs, both of them said, you know, it wasn't another, it wasn't Austin Briggs. It was Vuillard and Bonard. And I remember that very distinctly. And so I said, I, okay, I got to hunt that stuff down. And that's when I found your dad's Little Women series. And all of a sudden, that's where all that stuff clicked. I'm like, okay, now I see it. Now I see it. So I start in Dallas and I'm trying to find my own voice. And let me go back to these two here. So you can see in the Akron piece and this particular Dallas piece, I'm, I'm going out, I'm learning about getting reference, taking cameras, shooting photographs, and at this particular time, I'm shooting black and white, either with a Polaroid or black and white film, processing the film and making my drawing. So I, I got all these photos and I'm using the opaque projector to transfer the drawing down and then start applying color and paint. And I'm doing that and it's, it's okay, but at a certain point in time, and I think it may have been after a meeting with Fred Woodward or somebody, and I remember also talking with Wilson McLean that in looking at these pieces, they were saying, you know, it's all looking fine. It's fine. Uh, the noses are in the right places. Everything is where they're supposed to be, but I'm not seeing anything in your pictures that's telling me anything uniquely about you, how you think, what it is you do, anything special about you. What, what, what is that thing that separates you from somebody else? And I started thinking about it. And then I started at that time, I started thinking, you know, you've been drawing since you were in kindergarten. You've loved drawing. Drawing has been important to you when you were in second grade. I remember, you know, going to sleep at night, trying to visualize how to draw somebody's face. It was really critically important to me, even at that age. And so I've, I've said, you know, you love to draw. That's the key. And, and so trust the way you draw. Start having faith in that you can draw. So when I got this assignment to do this portrait of Elmer Doolin, who was the man who franchised Fritos, I just sat down and drew this picture out. And why the colors are why they are, I just wanted, because of it being in the 50s, I wanted to have a real pop, pop effect to it to some degree. I just pushed the colors and turns out Fred Wood would have liked it, Fred Wood would have liked it, and and you know, I started doing things where I was drawing the way I would want to draw. Um, we, this one here, uh, John, you and I talked about, you know, I loved Gil Stone and Gil Stone would stretch things vertically. So I had a format that was this vertical format and I wanted this cowboy and horse to fill that entire frame. If I had done it Perspective wise, there had been a lot more sky and a little lot more foreground. I wanted that horse and that cowboy to fill the entire space. So I, I stretched it a la Gil Stone and came up with this. And I thought that might be kind of a cool thing to do. But then I started realizing what happens if you get a, a horizontal format, you can't stretch. 
And so I started realizing what you do is you, you, the format and the design, the design is, is that you choose in your picture is somewhat dictated by the format. So it's a vertical format, you have certain constraints. And so you apply the spaces within that uh, format to uh, kind of define and help you form the design of your picture. And so this piece was a piece I did for Fred Woodward after he left Dallas and went up and was working in Washington, DC. And um, this is probably the piece that really jump-started my, my work as a freelance illustrator for more national publications. Um, prior to that, I was pretty much, so like I said, after college it was 1976 and go to all the way 1987, I was pretty much your kind of journeyman, local illustrator, just kind of getting through assignments here and there, doing okay, paying the bills, taking care of things. But when this particular piece ran, um, I, it seemed to capture um, the eye of a lot of art directors. And that's when I started getting other assignments um, from national publications. And so uh, Fred later on, uh, I moved it back to Cincinnati. Um, my wife and I had her son, Trevor, and we just felt it was important that he know his family, his roots. And so we moved back to Cincinnati. And this was the first assignment I did for Fred Woodward when he uh, moved to uh, Rolling Stone magazine. And um, once again, you know, I'm shooting my reference. I'm shooting, got a little moth in the house here anyway. Um, shooting my uh, reference, but you know, I'm freehanding everything else. I'm just, I'm just drawing. And I think that's such a critical part of, uh, you know, you do when you're trying to figure yourself out, you know, how do you draw? And so um, using reference, I'm a big proponent of that. You develop your ideas and your sketches and your layouts, and then you shoot your reference. And so this was my son, Trevor, modeling and and was telling John the story that uh it's probably about four and I said you know I need you to pose for this picture and he's like I don't want to do it because you know I was going to put a little tie on him a little shirt roll up his pants like knickers and I don't want to do this I want to do this I'm going I need this picture it's for, you know please you got to understand what this is for come on I want to do it I want to do it so finally, I said, look, you don't understand. What I want you to do is take this toy guitar. We're going to go outside. And I want you to smash it on the sidewalk and let me take your picture. And he goes, really? I said, yeah. He goes, okay, I'll do it. <laughs> it was, letting him smash the thing is what, what got him to do it. And he smashed it. And that was exactly that head cock and everything was in that shot. And it was perfect. And you know the, the 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 toy truck there, and the and the blocks are his. The toy dinosaur is his. Uh, that's his uh, quilt. Uh, he didn't have that uh, wrought iron fence, uh, on, you know, bed uh, bed posts. But so, uh, one, one a, a question: uh, What yeah. media is, uh, are you working in on this? this is, at this control? particular time is when I'm really starting to evolve in that technique where I'm using multiple mediums. It's acrylics, watercolor, uh, oils, colored pencil. But you know, we, we'll talk about it later when uh, with the mixed media with the oils of how I did that. I don't do it. I do it still some, but you you can't buy the spray fixative that I used to use. So I've had to kind of compensate for that. Chris is going to do two different approaches, two different right. um, uh, demos for us, uh, week three and four. Yeah, one of them is going to be a little bit more complicated, and you got to be careful with that. Now we'll talk about that with spray fixatives. The other one does not use any spray fixes. And so this is some of the work I did for Fred at Rolling Stone. Um, these were what they call history of rock and roll pieces, where it's kind of a whimsical take on the history of rock and roll. And that's, the, though this was not a rock and roll piece, this was for the same grouping. And it, we, what we were doing was, um, for some of you that are younger, Steve Martin used to have a bit when he did his stand-up routine, and he would wear this white suit. And he put this arrow through his head and would had, make some joke. And then he would say, excuse me. And he hold his chest 
and exaggerate the, the excuse me. And of course, Nixon uh, was uh, uh, drummed out of office and the title of this was, well, pardon me. Instead of excuse me, it was, well, pardon me. So we were kind of spoofing off of that. And then this was George Lucas I did. And then other magazines started to come to play. And so what happens in illustration, and it's a fairly, it still goes on, I think, today. When, when somebody sees something that you do and they think it's a little bit different, and they think there's a certain strength that you have in what you do, you start getting repeat calls for it. And so I got known for doing these kind of caricatured pieces, but in a style that wasn't your typical caricature. There was kind of a certain cross between caricature and realism. And the only way I can describe it is when I do my pictures, I, I, I try to add enough life into them that you actually believe them, if that makes any sense. Yeah, they're just extremely well informed. Yeah. Um, another question here. In the early days of your freelance career, did yeah. you think you were getting paid a fair wage for the time you spent on each piece? Well, the funny story, I mean, I will tell one story. Early on, I got called to do a double page spread for People magazine. And the money that I got paid was by far the most money I ever got paid at that time. By far. And I thought, my God, this is this is gold. This is incredible. And the deadline was so tight, they actually flew me to New York with the artwork, told me to bring some art supplies so if they had some changes, I could change in the hotel room, which they did. But prior to them giving me the changes, I had a conversation with the art director and um, said, what, what, what made you call me? Well, they saw that Nancy Reagan piece. And she said, we had asked David Levine to do the artwork. And David Levine was a well-known caricaturist uh, illustrator for many, many years, very famous. And she said his price was X number of dollars, which was nearly three times what I was getting paid. So he was asking three times what I was getting paid. And I thought I was making the most money I had ever, well, and I was making the most money I'd ever made. It was just like I was, and yet I realized at that moment, you know, I just ripped this guy off, you know, and so it's, it's, it's a funny thing, the way illustration works. So early on, um, I, I thought I was getting good money. And when I started working with my rep, I was getting fine money. But um, in comparison to what art was being sold for in years before, in the end, you could say no, but it's all understandable because you know, back in the days when Leindecker was making his artwork and Rockwell was making some of his artwork and, and Wyeth and those folks, you know, they weren't competing with television. Movies were just beginning to come out. The, the radio was limited. So print medium in a lot of those publications, that was, that was a huge form of communication and entertainment for people. Today, magazines are not as popular people are finding other ways but meanwhile illustrators are finding other ways to be able to sell their artwork and produce artwork for different venues so though the newspapers aren't what they were magazines magazines aren't what they were illustrators are still finding ways to be able to sell their work and find clients for their work and it's no longer when i got started only working in akron or regionally Nowadays, you can be selling your artwork to clients in Japan, in Iceland, in Finland, in Argentina, just as easily as an artist in Argentina can work for a magazine in Cincinnati. So it, it, it's a different animal nowadays. It just totally, I don't know if that answers the question, but I, I think it explains. Oh, I, I think it does. It gives it some context of, you know, how it's changed. Um, I mean, my God, I mean, you know, you go back to Frederick Rodrigo Gruger was doing these black and white illustrations for magazines and he was getting paid. I mean, he was earning nearly $100,000 in 1910, 1920. 
that was more than the president of the United. That was more than movie stars back in those days. Right. And, you know, there, that stuff didn't exist for it to compete. Magazines were the place for everywhere you got all that information. So and I, I get started, I get noted for these images. And so, and, and of course, my, my illustrations aren't just purely a caricature. There's a lot of people who do great caricature, but they're just simply heads with backgrounds and that's it. Um, I mean, there are some great, great artists who do incredible caricatures like uh, Sebastian Kruger and Philip Burke and people of that nature. But, but, you know, here, this is a story about Joe Namath who, if you're my age, you know, Joe Namath did uh, an ad for pantyhose, which you have this football player advertising for pantyhose. And you can see kind of particularly at that particular time, it was, it was groundbreaking to some degree. And, you know, for a lot of football players, it was very off-putting. And so I'm spoofing off of the uh, famous Betty Grable uh, poster of her and her legs and using Joe Namath and the disgust of his players to tell that story, you know, and you see the jacket that Joe Namath has, he was very flamboyant, whereas the other guy in his locker, he's got the black sport coat and the traditional tie and the white shirt. So you're putting these two worlds kind of colliding together. And so the illustration is not just a caricature, but it's a story. And I think that ended up turning out to be one of my strengths to the work I was doing was in the narratives that I was telling in my caricatures. This was Kathy Bates uh, for the movie Misery. And so you can see I'm spoofing off of Norman Bates and the Bates Motel. And I gave her a sledgehammer like you'd see Chuck Jones with uh, Warner Brothers cartoons. And so you take the Bates Motel Kathy Bates and Warner Brothers, and what do you got? This illustration. Chris, I have to, I have to say this. I think of how many times? Well, twenty-five times I watched you give a presentation, at least to the Illustration Academy, um, and there were other short, shorter workshops that we've done together. Yeah, and half of those times uh, after George joined us we would sit in the back and we just tears coming out of our eyes laughing at <laughs> this, this is, this is, I mean, it's, it's, it's such great drawing, such great imagery, but they're just funny. Um, they're, they're well, that, that's what I try to do. You know, I mean, there, there are characterists who, who take their pictures and they, uh, you know, they do the, what the, whatever it is they do. I, I really just try to have fun with them. I mean, uh, famous people, I think are wonderful vehicles for us to have fun with whether we like them or not like them I the one thing I try not to do is be mean in my pictures I try to have fun with them and 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 because I want the viewer to have fun with it you know I think it, it's it, it works so much better you know and so here's one where I got to do a little landscape work and that was fun to do and so as I say I I started getting known. This one here, we did it this way because they wanted him to look like he was made of concrete. And there was a certain thing because this was an article about the legacy of Reagan. So, you know, after he has come and gone and he's no longer with us, we still have the remnants of him. And so we, I try to do him in this kind of concrete like uh, look to it. And then here's Bill Clinton playing the saxophone. And this was my first uh, illustration of Vladimir Putin, which was when he first took office as president of the uh, Soviet Union. It was a story about him prior to uh, being the president. He was a spy, you know, worked for the KGB. And there was a famous movie, um, a John Le Carre movie that starred Richard Burton called The Spy Who Came In From The Cold. And that was the title of this particular article, the spy who came in from the cold who became president. And so I wanted to illustrate him kind of as this figure amongst the crowd, just kind of how he kind of is just part of the crowd as a spot, you know, effective spies are people who just blend in. 
um, some more character work for Time. And then eventually I was, I, I did a number of pieces for Time Magazine to the point when I eventually uh, was asked to do some covers. And that was a great deal of joy to do those. But, you know, for you guys who want to do editorial and editorial is a great vehicle, but the one thing that John knows about editorial, I mean, his dad worked with it and had to deal with it. And that is just the craziness of deadlines that that editorial gives. I mean, John can probably tell the stories of how many all-nighters his father pulled over the years. And time would call me on a Wednesday afternoon and the art would have to be in New York on Friday. And this is all before you could electronically send it. You literally have, I literally would have to finish the art around two to three or four o'clock in the morning drive it down to the Cincinnati airport to put it on the six, six o'clock flight to LaGuardia. And then somebody would pick it up at LaGuardia and turn it into Time Magazine. So you, you basically are working from like three in the afternoon till three o'clock and four o'clock in the morning, uh, Friday morning, Thursday night, Friday morning to get the job done. So it's, it's a crazy lifestyle. It was, I could never do it now. I'm just too, there's no way I can do that today. When I was younger, I could handle it. My family could handle it. But it's very stressful on the family, though, when when you have jobs like that to come in and all of a sudden, you know, the plans that you had to go to see a play or take your kids to a ball game all get shut down when all of a sudden a Time Magazine call comes in. Well, the irony to that mm -hmm. is it's the most seen jobs you have th that you do. Well, um, and that that's that's why that's the that's why it's kind of the only job that you let that happen. I've got a very good friend of mine, Chuck, and I have known each other since we were four years old. We've been friends since four years old, and we had a trip to Cooperstown to go to the Hall of Fame. And a time job came in, and I had to call him say, "Chuck can't go." And I don't think he spoke to me for about eight months. He was really pissed, and and so I had to talk with him and sit, sat down, and explained everything, and he later said I did not realize how important he goes now I, I totally understood he understood I mean he's very successful uh well, what I was referring to Chris was the fact that it the of all the pieces that you've done your time pieces more people have seen them than anything else exactly I mean and and, and so you're judged by that of this piece of artwork you have to do in a day and, um, and you can't and you can't screw that up I mean if you you know, Time right. isn't going to, Time Magazine's not going to call you back if you give them a half a loaf. You got to give them everything, and they got to believe that when you when you turn it in, that they can see that you gave it everything you could. I mean, I think they could understand if if I did a piece that well, I did a piece one time for him, put it on the plane, and LaGuardia was snowed in, and that plane circled LaGuardia and then came back to Cincinnati, and they ended up running a Tim O'Brien illustration instead of mine. And it was just, it was just what happened and they, they understood, but it just, yeah, you, you, you can't, you can't flop uh, when you're doing this. And I think this was the last time cover um, I did for them. Uh, and then uh, Arthur retired and although I, mean, I don't know whether Arthur, Arthur may have not been the art director. I don't know, but uh, this one here was uh, my last time cover. Um, this was a, uh, or maybe no, I guess let me check the date. What's the date of that? Well, that was a little out, folks. Maybe this is the last one. I don't know. But this was obviously this one here is a little. Uh, you can see stylistically this is different because they specifically wanted me to be as real as I could be, and they sent me the photo reference, and I made sure that Time Magazine got the approval and compensated the photographer for the use of this reference, and it was a great photograph. But it was still horrific as far as the deadline. And um, it was a tough one to do. Um, but uh, it's probably um, my best shot at doing what I guess you would call it the classic time covers back in the days of uh, the ABCs of time. And that the, they, they had a group of artists through the 40s and the 50s. Boris uh, Artsebeshev, um, Ernst Hamlin Baker and Boris Chalipin, that's the ABC. That's why they called them the ABCs. And they were great artists and they did incredible images for Time Magazine 
for 20 plus years for them. Eventually guys like Robert Vickery came in and others. And then over time, they got more creative as far as the style of artists from Ben Sean and um, Gerald Scarf and Jack Davis and Bob Peak. And John, I think you're dead. I know he's dead. Did he do two covers? John? I think he did seven. Seven? Yeah, I know, he, did, I know. he did some pieces that were not, you know, like he did Uncle Sam. Yeah, I know that. Uh, he did the, the um, Ronald Reagan, the um, Generation Gap. Um, we had the two heads facing each other. Okay. Uh, oh yeah, Reagan. that one. Um, and there, you know, I think there were probably out of the seven. I think there were only five that were that ran. Yeah, and, uh, and that was happen. pretty. That was common. Um, yeah, that would happen. So you know, but it was, but like I said, it, it, they were brutal headlines. They were brutal. And this was a cover job that did not run, but it ended up running on the inside. It ran on the inside. And then somewhere down the line, uh, Entertainment Weekly called me and I started getting some of these assignments where it wasn't one figure, it was multiple figures. And you know, the great disadvantage of this is the deadlines are the same and the pay is the same. Whether you do a singular piece like that or this, the pay is always the same. It's a paid rate. And when all of a sudden people saw I could do this, then I started to get this and this. Careful, careful what you ask for. Yeah, exactly. I mean, this was a fun piece. Yeah, it's one but, of my favorites. I love it. Yeah, I think you, do you have, do you have the Jerry Seinfeld one? Um. Did you get that one? Yeah. Okay. Have, yeah. Yeah. You got the Jerry Seinfeld one. No, no, I don't have Jerry Seinfeld. Oh. I have, I, I have, I have a Bruce Springsteen. And right, but your dad, your dad got. My dad has the Seinfeld. My dad had the Seinfeld. Right, right. Um, so no, he don't have that. So. I got the, 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 the recent, the most recent one was the Obama. The, right. The fingers. right. And then uh, this was for, uh, what men's health magazine about nasty things men say and then this was gossip and other things men say so you know all of a sudden you're getting <laughs> i mean it's just head after head after head and you're just trying to put it together how how, how large are the uh, finishes um i would say that's probably uh, 14 inches wide something like that 13 to 14 inches wide by 17 inches tall so the heads are like Two and a half, three yeah. inches across. But man, and I don't even know whether I could do that now because as as you get older, your eyes are more strained. It's it's tough. There was a question: uh, uh, Do you not have the freedom to negotiate your pays pay and fee? You do, you do, but it's limited. Again, you know, it's if you were to say, "Oh, well, I should get paid," you know, three hundred dollars a head. Okay, do the math, and no, they're not going to pay you that. They have their page rate which may be $1,500. And then if they say, well, because you're doing so much more, okay, we'll give you an extra 500 or something along those lines, but they're just not going to now. I mean, there's some artists that they would. And, and again, I think it's a just, it is a different world as, as, as much as you can try to, I mean, I, every now and then could get a little bit more money and, and you could fight for it and you, and you try to, and then sometimes you just have to say, no, I mean, I'm not going to kill myself. I mean, my, my wife still jokes, uh, you know, because there were times, you know, I'd be working, it's four o'clock in the morning, and she'd come downstairs, you know, and say, okay, just want to see you're still breathing, and go back up to bed, you know, because I'm just the, the hours that you would put in on some of these jobs, and then, you know, here I got to do Mad Magazine, and I got to have my buddy Craig in there, Paul is in there, and Evan's in there, and other friends are in there, guys some guys went to high school with their kids and then uh i got to do for i think it was four four or four and a half years i got to do the back covers of reader's digest which were kind of i i knew going into it that i was going to be somewhat criticized as them being quasi rockwellian um simply because you're 
kind of taken a humorous take on contemporary American life. But I, I, the only thing I tried my best to do is do the kind of pictures that you want to do. Don't try to say, okay, how would Rockwell have handled it? How would he have done this picture? Try to do it in your own voice. But I just knew by virtue of the subject matter, no matter what you do with the level of realism that I was trying to get, that was going to be kind of the critique of him. And it was. But certain pieces, I think, came out far more successful than others. It started off where I had plenty of time and then they kept on, you know, changing things and changing ideas till finally at the end, we were crushed with deadlines because they, they lollygagged on that. So the ones that I always thought were better were the ones where we had more time to work out the idea and they gave me plenty of time to get the ex to execute the art properly. This was one of my favorites. And I, and, and I think what made this piece really work, as, as I told them, was if you guys, you guys all know rivalries and sometimes in football rivalries can get out of hand. As a matter of fact, I guess they just, after the Michigan, Michigan State game, there's some fighting going on. So things can get out of hand. And so you got these guys with their, you know, snarling at each other and everybody angry at. But what to me made the picture work was my buddy Jack on the right. Uh, Jack Guggenheim was who was a very dear friend uh, laughing at the scene having that brevity in this image where everybody's kind of snarling at each other I think uh, made this piece work and these are a few more then I got to do some advertising and again got to use my son and uh, and you friends things like this. And so I'm a big proponent of getting your reference. Um, of course, there's no reference for this, but you can find some, you know, you get enough reference to make it work. So I show these because everybody knows I do people. Well, you know, guess what? Yeah, I can do animals too. And I think that's the strength that, that if, if anything, if there's anything that I were to say that I bring to the art that I do, that makes my work um, acceptable is the fact I can draw. I mean, it's the core of what I do. Um, it's what I do best and it comes through. And, and I think most people now have come to the clue. There's that buddy Gravel pose again. Um, it's the kind of thing that demonstrates to, to your clients and gives them confidence in working with you is if they can see that that you can draw. I have I'll I'll add on to that a little bit. Um, probably the second or third night we were doing our illustration isolation drawing, and uh, there were quite a few of us in there. George uh, was drawing with us. Uh, um, myself, I think Dale was there. You you were obviously there, and um, I don't know who else. Uh, but uh, Timmy was trying to get you know people to post their work and said and he made a statement he said uh you know come on everybody this isn't a like a contest or anything um we're just you know you just we're drawing and put your work up and right about i mean within 10 seconds i get a text from george pratt and said what is timmy watching doesn't he know what we're trying to do we're just trying to not be embarrassed by you by chris <laughs> which is so true um you're a great drawer. Well, that, that's my strength, you know, and you, you, you and I know, because I've had this conversation with your dad. Your dad's a painter. I'm a drawer. And my, my, my illustrations are, are, have paint on them, but they're painted drawings. Your dad drew as a, he drew like a painter. He was a painter from the get-go. Yeah. And, and that comes through. This was a job I, I got to do. It, I showed this because I'm, I'm really proud of this piece and trying to develop a good idea. Um, ideas are so critical and you don't know where they come from other than they come from doing a lot of sketching, a lot of thumbnailing, working out ideas, trying this, trying that. They just don't pop. I mean, they do pop in your head, but they pop in your head after you've made a number of drawings and try this, try this, try this, and something comes through. So I get called by this guy who they were putting together a book going to be on Star Wars, the art of Star Wars. And um, 
you know, they had a fee that they were paid. It was a very professional fee. And, uh, but he said, you, you have total creative freedom. And I told him, you know, you know, I saw Star Wars, but I'm not a real Star Wars guy. You know, my, my kids are. But, and he said, that's okay. We, we, you know, we, we love your art and we'd love you to do something. And I said, well, I, I'm kind of a, my stuff has usually has humor in it. You know, I find humor in things. And he goes, that's okay. We, we, anything you want to do, whatever you want to do. And so he said, like, we had this one guy, he did this picture of this stormtrooper, and he was doing this and we thought that was great. And I said, yeah, okay, but that's not funny. You know, my stuff, I usually try to make fun, you know, have fun. And so I was, so because I opened my mouth and said, okay, I'm going to make fun, do have, not make fun, but be funny. I was working out ideas and go, well, that's not that funny. And I would do it. That's not that funny. And eventually this thing, you know, came into my mind about how George Lucas, the, the movie that gave Lucas the financial confidence and backing was uh, a movie called American Graffiti. And the success and the money that American Graffiti made for him, gave him, because he had done some science fiction movies before that flopped. And this one gave the studio's confidence in him. And, and in that movie, um, there's a character that his nickname was called Toad. He, they called him Toad. Uh, Charles Martin Smith played him. He was a good character actor. And so... I can't, I, I always thought the character of Jabba the Hutt, he looked like a toad. So I thought, what, do, what would, what would Jabba the Hutt's high school graduation picture look like? And what would be the Star Wars, you know, in, you know, high school yearbook, what would it look like? And so I came up with this idea of Jabba the Hutt's high school graduation. And I thought for sure they was going to say, they were going to say, this is just too stupid. No, we won't. And, but they said, we love it. And so I got to do it. And then lo and behold, I don't know, about six months later, got a call that Lucas wanted to buy it. And so I don't know where it, where it sits. I don't know if he burned it or what he did with it, but, but he bought it. Uh, so I think maybe he, he kind of got the, the inside humor and storyline behind uh, this idea for him. But I've always liked this one. And then children's books, I've been doing more of over the years. And again, I think the thing that has made children's books attractive to me are two things. One, um, you know, you're not crushing yourself on deadlines as much. But two, you know, children's books last. You know, you kill yourself to do a Time magazine cover and it's on the newsstands for a week and then it's gone. And for the most part, it's gone and it's forgotten where I, I have done children's books and I talk now to college age people, young people, and they tell me how their, their parents read this book to them and they have it and they're, they can't wait to be able to read it to their kids. And so the, it, it, it's so gratifying to, to have those moments. So um, I really enjoy being able to do some children's books. So I've done some for Casey at the Bat these are a few of them. And I, I had friends of mine who modeled for me. That's a Jay, Jay Bauer. And then Evan modeled for, my son Evan modeled for this one for Remarkable Fargo McBride. And this is a friend of mine's son who modeled for this one, who grew my soup. And so I've been able to have fun doing children's books and, and I still do them. Um, I do do local work and I still am able to incorporate, you know, I said I wanted to be a baseball player. So every now and then I do get to do jobs that are based on the things I love baseball. And this is a group of Cincinnati Reds that was done for a print that was put out by the Cincinnati Art Museum to raise money. And I think they raised probably about $100,000, $150,000 on this print. Wow. And we did That's baseball. impressive. Yeah, I, it, um, maybe you can elaborate on that a little bit more. I mean, uh, personal interest, obviously, your love of baseball, but also it's your it's your hometown, it's your backyard. Yeah, and and being involved with the community and you know what value that has had to you. 
Well, it's had a huge value and I'll show you here in just one moment in particular, one in particular. This, I, this one here I did for uh, a local um, organization that now has disbanded, but you know they brought Randy Johnson in and they asked me to do a print, uh, a piece of art that they auctioned and they raised money for scholarships. And this was a fun one to do of uh, Randy Johnson. And if you know anything about Randy Johnson, he's 6'10", and he is every bit of 6'10". And uh, he signed the original and they auctioned it off and it, it was great fun. But um, let me get to the one that you're talking about, this one here. So um, we just had a, the Miracle League Ball in which I did artwork for that. Um, Joe Knoxell was a pitcher for the Cincinnati Reds. He, he holds the record for being the youngest pitch player to play professional baseball in the major leagues. He was 15 years old. And at 15 years old, he had a face stand musial in his prime. Um, he, he didn't quite last the inning. And afterwards, he got sent down to the minors and took him seven years to come make it back. But he pitched for the Reds for 16 years and announced for the Reds for 31 years before he retired. And his family has uh, a field. It's called the uh, Joe Knoxall Miracle League field. And they have this mirror, what they call the Miracle League. And at these, they got two ballparks. And at these two ballparks, they have a baseball league dedicated for uh, kids with various forms of handicaps. And now they have it also set up for adults. So you, and when you go to these, these events and you watch these things, um, if you're not changed by it, you know, I don't know what's wrong because it is, it is so amazing. And the league is set up in a way, it's not like one of these deals where a kid comes to play baseball for a day. Oh, you get to, you know, you don't have to feel handicapped this one day to play baseball. It's not that they have a league. And in the springtime, they have an opening day, an opening day parade where they have bands, they have former ball players, cars, old time cars. This whole parade drives down uh, Main Street in Fairfield, Ohio, goes down Millis Road, turns in to go to the ball game. They have their ball game. They have, uh, they start with the uh, national anthem. They've got, you can see Jumbotron, the kids' names are called. They have announcers and they play baseball and they play baseball all year long, every weekend. These kids are out there and they're playing baseball and they've had engineers from the University of Cincinnati who have developed a, a, a bat swinging thing for kids who have absolutely no mobility with their hand, with their arms that all they have to do is push this button and the bat swings to hit the ball for them. And then they have their motorized wheelchairs and they can navigate their way around. They have people that kind of walk along with them to make sure they're safe. Uh, they've actually developed a baseball that beeps for somebody who is blind to be able to hit the baseball and play. They've now developed a uh, putt-putt golf course and where these kids can play and they're working on developing an indoor facility that will also include a zip line. And it's, it's an amazing thing. And to watch these families in our community, to be able to uh, have these moments with their families is, is so unique. And that's a picture of Joe and that's the outfield wall. He's kind of leaning over, waving to the fans um, to say hello to everybody. Uh, greeting everybody at the ballpark and it was a thrill to do this well that's you know um you took that uh to a place i wasn't i wasn't uh, aware of where you're going to go with them it's phenomenal i love i love listening to that the value for the community of the artists in the community to be able to contribute to that but the value of you being involved and other people uh uh, uh, becoming aware of who you are and, and what you do is so important to the artist. Um, you know, my, my own community has supported me in a huge way and um, it's, it, it makes a huge difference being involved in your, uh, you know, pay attention to what's going on in your backyard. Yeah. The one, <laughs> if you knew Joe and, and his announcing with the Reds, uh, uh, his son, Kim, was saying the only change he would have made in that picture 
was instead of him waving, he would have put a Budweiser on his hand. <laughs> <laughs> he said that would have been more appropriate. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. So, but it is, it is, it is an amazing experience. And so you go there and it's fantastic. Um, um, get to the next thing here, which is uh, I did got to illustrate this version of Tom Sawyer for a publisher, and they had contacted me earlier to try to do it, and we couldn't agree on how to do it, how to approach it, and so it kind of disappeared. And I did some other work for him in another project, project, and so he said, "Can we bring this back?" And I said, well, let me read it again. I'll come back to you and let me see if I can propose something else to you. And so I read Tom Sawyer, I think two, maybe three more times, just to read it and reread it and get it through it and everything. And it dawned on me as I was reading it that it reads like a journal. And, and John, you know me, I'm a big proponent of sketchbooks and the value of a sketchbook. And when I go on vacation, oftentimes, although I didn't do it on this Italian trip, to take sketchbooks to, as journals. And so I, I said this, there, because in Tom Sawyer, there's no flash forwards, no flashbacks, no symbols, no this, no that. It's just that, you know, it's like four months in a, in a boy's life one summer when he's like 11 or 12 years old, 10 to 11, somewhere in that time period before he gets into the teenage adolescence, it's that time. And so I thought, well, what if I were to illustrate it like a sketchbook? And if I did, you know, they wouldn't have to be as highly polished to finish pieces. It would be have a more of a journalistic feel to it that I think would fit. And so I told the, the uh, publisher I could do this and I could do maybe about 40 pictures for you. And he thought that was great. In the end, I think I did about 75 pictures for him. And so once he agreed to it, then I started thinking, well, I don't want him to do all pencil drawings. So how can I apply color to these pictures without oil washes and all this other stuff that makes it no longer a journal that it just ends up being more kind of painted. We lose that journalistic feel. And Gary Kelly does these uh, monoprints and they're fantastic. But I knew I didn't want to do mono prints because that's Gary Kelly's turf. And, you know, as they say, John, you don't tug on Superman's cape. And, and so that's, that's good analogy. <laughs> you know, yeah, it, you know, that's, that's Gary's turf. And if I were to do that, the whole world would know, well, you're just riffing on Gary. So I'm going, I can't do that. So I'm thinking, how can I do this? And I, I think it was actually, with you at one of the workshops, I did a drawing of Robert Henry. And I said, let's see what happens if I take a brayer with some acrylics and, and do this. And so what I ended up doing was taking brayers with uh, kind of a burnt umber on some of them and some other stuff and, and it worked out. And so this doesn't have it. This is just a, a drawing with water with some acrylics. But th this one you can see I've drawn I put some uh, acrylics, but then I roll this uh, uh, paint on top of it and to get a certain look to it. You know, here you can see there, there you can see around Aunt Polly as she's hugging Tom, this kind of gray rolled on color that gives kind of a deckled edge to it that I'm able to then draw on top of it with some colored pencil to pull out some of the form. And you get that raw edge that gives this kind of spontaneous feel to it. This is where Injun Joe is breaking out of the courtrooms to escape uh, justice. And this one doesn't have the, so you can see some of them I did put the color on, some of them I didn't. And I started to find something here that I was really enjoying. And so then when the opportunity for me to do a a series of illustrations for the Cincinnati Pops Orchestra as they were going to be performing Prokofiev's Peter and the Wolf. Um, I, I proposed that, again, they wanted a number of images and they had a limited amount of time. And the only way that I could do it was in this technique that's it's a little quicker and it's a little more spontaneous, but I, I like the feel that it has. 
and they seem to like it and agree to it. So I did this, whoops, I guess that's the only one I showed. So I did, I did about 45 pictures for this, um, for Peter and the Wolf. And then, um, and I'll show more work of this. And then I've done some other books like this for Mickey Mantle, and this. And every now and then I get asked to, you know, propose, put some artwork in a gallery show. You know, they wanted, you know, some landscapey things. So I did a few, my few efforts at landscape. Um, and then most recently I've been, when, when, when an editorial job does come my way, I still will do a few editorial pieces. Um, this was for Spectrum, which was really unusual because I'm not known as, in this world, but it was fun to be able to try to do something. I did about seven or eight ideas and this was the one that they selected. Um, you explain that a little bit more. You did it for Spectrum. You didn't do it to enter Spectrum. This was the call for entries, wasn't it? Right. Yeah. They they had asked me. I I think they did a series. I don't think this was the only call for entries. I think they probably had four or five different pieces of art that they used for call for entries. But this was one um, that um, I got to work on, and it was a great deal of fun. Um, a great a great choice. And well, it a, it, I I had a you know I had some other quirky ideas i try to be well you know the one thing i did remember when we did a, a demo for you uh we did a live demo where i did that head and the hand that yeah. was one of my ideas for them but this one this was this was great fun to do it really has that kind of uh fun feel to it that i think is appropriate for the kind of work i do um this was a christmas reading list and this is probably the most recent editorial piece I did for the week for uh, the Washington Examiner. And, and so getting back to the sketchbook art, I mean, this is, this is kind of a, a regular thing I do. Um, I've got a sketchbook back here with some artwork that I play around with that I was prepping for, just trying to do something for, the, for Halloween. But uh, this was... The thing that's neat about this, I do the drawing and I roll over it with color, with uh, acrylics, with this ultra matte medium. And we'll do a demo of this for you guys. But this is the thing that was cool about it was I remember also when I was up there with you, John, remember I rolled over one in blue. I had never done it before. I said, well, let's see what happens right. if it's successful in blue. And it turned out great and people loved it. So I said, okay, well, let's do, what about this color? What if I run some black over it? What if I run this over it? And then I did one on uh, toned paper, put some black and rolled over it and came up with this. So, you know, when you do sketchbook art and, and you do this, I, I mean, I don't show everybody all, everything in my sketchbook because not everything works. Not everything is successful, but, I'm always playing around with things in my sketchbook because that's the place to do that. That's the place to push. Um, I don't. Um, that's I, great. I'm glad you're touching upon that about how important the value of experimentation. Um, because, well, if you do it in a sketchbook, you're not seeing it. If, look, if I were to try to experiment on a Time magazine that's due tomorrow or the next day, that's insane because you know if I screw up, I've screwed up a client, I've screwed an art director, I've done everything. But in a sketchbook, it's not a precious thing. It's not this thing that, oh, my God, if it doesn't work, what's going to happen? If it doesn't work, okay, turn the page. It's another piece of art. Um, one of my favorite expressions from a wonderful teacher I taught many years with at CCAD, Mark Hazelrig, he had a quote that just sticks with me all the time. The only one taking a risk in your art is the paper. You know, and it's, he's so right on that. I've always equated that because I heard that from you a number of times. I always, I always, I always uh, giving you credit for that quote. But I, uh, um, thanks no, for I, thanks for coming clean on it. No, no, that's all. No, I always it's give a great Mark, quote. I always give Mark credit for that. I mean, Mark was Mark uh, was a Marine, saw serious, serious stuff in Vietnam. I mean, his great line was. What are you going to do? Shave me bald head and send me to hell? I've already been there, you know. And so, no, uh, he 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 was a great great teacher. And so here's another one. Here I rolled. You can see I rolled over this pig drawing I did of 
of uh, Charles Dana Gibson and I rolled over it in red. And then I took a palette knife with some color and just pushed it around. That's uh, acrylics with thick gel medium on in a sketchbook. Same thing here is a drawing of Kurt Russell and all you can see how thickly I'm laying that cobalt kind of blue on that background. And it's just pretty raw, but it all works. These sketchbooks are so, uh, so beautiful. I mean, it, it, you say there's uh, some clunkers in there, but oh, yeah. you know, for you, there might be some, but in, in a, a body of them, because it's not, even the sketchbooks you choose are not like, um, uh, really valuable sketchbooks i mean they're yeah. very uh very uh, uh utilitarian sketchbook yeah it's, they're, they're, they're they kind of spiral and how many how many pages are like is there 24 or 48 pages to it oh no no it's more than that i think uh, let's see this one's 100 sheets I don't okay. know. Can, can people see me in the corner yeah, absolutely okay there it is right there i kept thinking they were like 48 but the oh, remember uh, you know these things so they're yeah. just these you know there you go speaking of halloween there you go. Yep. Now, there's one we did, remember, of George Clooney? Yeah. And so, and I do develop my ideas where I develop my bird ideas there, some sketches, things like that. And so it's it's the place where, where you do all this, you know, I come up with, you know, I did this one I thought was a funny one. But there's and things I, in the, but there's things in the sketchbook that are, you know, really finishes too. Oh yeah, um, and and it I, just it just kills me. You got you know, well you said a hundred plus images in that sketchbook. Maybe uh, to me, all of them are are, are, are phenomenal. But, yeah, I'm uh, up to like twenty five sketchbooks so far just in those <laughs> in the last few years. <laughs> so, but you know, and then recently, and I'll quickly tell this story. The, these are paintings that I'm been doing recently on masonite jesso masonite and what happened was i got called to do a job for a, a large client where they wanted me to do um two paintings uh, at least 60 inches wide and you can't you can't get my illustration board that big and i didn't want to take two pieces glue them together and have that scene showing um, so i thought well why not paint on masonite and so I uh, works, was working out the ideas, drawing them out. And they were complicated pictures with lots of people uh, in the pictures, famous people kind of interacting with just average people. And a lot of reference, a lot of sketching, a lot of drawing. And everything was going fine. And then they, I said, look, you've got this deadline. It's due th th at this time. I need to go start buying my art supplies. I need to get the masonite. I got to get my studio set up for something this big. I got to rearrange the furniture, things like that around so I can get this done. And she said, okay, go ahead, get your supplies. So, you know, and, you know, John, you know, seeing your dad painting with um, uh, latex house paint, I went and was, bought a bunch of latex house paint, got my jars, got all, got a lot of those test sizes of colors that I wanted. And you know, like two days before I was supposed to get started, the client pulled the job. It's done, gone. And, you know, they had to pay so much up front, you know, to get me started. And of course they knew they weren't getting that back. There's no way because all, all the time I invested in it. So now I got all this masonite, all this paint, and I'm going, what the hell am I going to do? And so I thought, well, why don't you just paint pictures of what you want to paint? Just do what you want to do with it. May as well experiment with this, push it around. And so um, years ago, I did this painting of, uh, I, again, filling the space, using the space to design the shape. And all I wanted to do was this large chicken filling in this square. And when I got pretty much so done with the chicken, I looked at it and I said, damn, that chicken looks like the state of Ohio. So I said, well, let's flush it out and make it look even more like Ohio. So that's what I did. And that's one of those down at the bottom. And so when I got done with it, I posted it on Instagram. And this guy up in Vermont said, can I buy it? And he wants to give it to his wife for a gift. 
I said, okay. Gave him a price, not a heavy price because it was it's only 12 inches. And he bought it. So then I said, well, I wonder if I could do a cow. So I did a cow. Somebody bought that. Then I did another cow and somebody bought that. And I thought, well, what about a cardinal? Cardinal is the state bird of Ohio. So the one in the top right hand corner I did and I posted it and somebody bought it. So I thought, well, I wonder if I could do another one. If I stuck the head on the other side, would it work? And I did that. And somebody bought that. And then eventually somebody said, what's with you in the state of Ohio? Can you do an Illinois Cardinal? And my first reaction was, you know, I live in Ohio. You want your own Cardinal, paint your own Cardinal. <laughs> but I thought, well, you know what? I wonder if I could do an Illinois Cardinal. So I painted it and posted it and somebody bought it. And then I, it started leading to me, well, I wonder if I could do this state in a, in a bird. And then I started thinking more and more. And so I've been, I ended up painting, um, I've done all 50 states and I'm working on developing text right now. And I'm gonna try to pitch it to see if I can sell it as a state bird book. Um, I presented it to the postal service to see if there would be interest in making posted stamps out of them. I have uh, got other ideas with them. And then if nobody wants them, well, then I'll put them in frames and see if a gallery wants to put them up and we'll sell them, do the best we can. So that's, that's, that's kind of the thing here, but I've totally enjoyed painting on Masonite. And so I'm going to do more of it. I just went and got some more Masonite and I, I'm gessoing them right now, but these are some other, the other states and there's uh, Nevada and Missouri right there. And, and people ask me about, you know, well, how, why'd you put that, you know, like Nevada? And I, I mean, the idea is basically if you ever watch like a Tom and Jerry cartoon and Jerry's head gets stuck in Tom, he's the cat, Tom's head gets stuck in a mailbox. His head comes out the shape of the mailbox. And so I figured do that with the birds too. So hence the that's why the November, the Nevada mountain bluebird looks the way it does. A couple of questions for you, Chris. First of yeah. all, back to the sketchbook. What what pa weight paper are you working on there? Uh, let's see here. This is 60 pound. And the toned gray paper is 80 pound. It's just that standard. Yeah, just your... your... You know, you Standard get them Strathmore on, sketchbook. Yeah, you got sometimes I'll wait for them to go on sale and you can buy them for about seven bucks and I'll buy like 10 of them. They're great, you know, and again, it, it just allows you. To, somebody, somebody's suggestion to do a bird state puzzle. Um, oh, I've already, uh, trust me, that's what I'm trying to get these publishers to understand is the licensing. Right. Puzzles are on the list coffee pugs are on the list calendars uh, everything. everything okay so the next uh somebody uh, uh paul uh have you done massachusetts of course yeah. <laughs> he's yeah. done all 50 all um, 50 of them as a matter of fact uh i talked with somebody from massachusetts who said you know when those are available for sale let me know because i want it i said okay your name's on it what's uh, what was the most difficult state for you i found uh let's see well some are a challenge, but as they work through, they were better. I, it took me a while to uh, enjoy New Hampshire because the finch's neck is, you know, it's not like that quite, you know, if, I don't know if there's a way, because I don't know if people can see it because the uh, pictures are over it. You know, Florida was a challenge because Florida is the mockingbird. You would think Florida would be some kind of egret, but it's, it's the mockingbird. Uh, I remember early on, some guy said, oh, yeah, well, let's see you pull off Michigan. Well, that was a snap, really. Yeah. It just had, you had two robins in the picture, one representing the Upper Peninsula. And the, uh, I got lucky with, um, I got lucky with Hawaii because Hawaii state bird is the um, Hawaiian goose. So the big state was Mama and the other smaller islands were the goslings, you know, the little baby geese. Right. And it worked. It worked out well. 
do you have um somebody's asking if you have montana on your in your slideshow here uh it's not in this slideshow but it's on my instagram there you go and he is and in montana is flying in that one because i think there's six states that have the uh the meadowlark as its state bird six states i think seven states have the cardinal five states have the mockingbird i think there's only um i think 19 states um have our states that have are the only state that have that bird i think like the gold finch i think there's three states with the gold finch uh the the purple finch that's new hampshire they're the only state that has the purple finch uh vermont is the only state that has the uh hermit uh thrush things like that so this is this this could lead into an interesting direction of conversation which i don't want to go too far with it tonight because when we have 20 minutes left and you have more to show yeah. but um you know the idea of creating work that's wrapped around an idea that has you know a way to monetize it oh 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 you know exactly. something that's what we talk about that's part of what we talk about even on our program is yeah you know, being able to monetize the art that, that you're passionate about, you know, if somebody, if an art director didn't call you and you had all the freedom to be able to make art based on the things you care about and that you love, what would that be? Some people love sports. Some people like fantasy. Some people would paint trains. Some pe people would paint. We talked about Christopher Blossom, who paints not really beautiful nautical paintings. Yeah. And he comes from a family of illustrators with a deep illustration background. Um, you've got people who do wildlife there and, you know, there are great vehicles, uh, for the things that you care about. I mean, it, it, you know, we all, you know, the illustrators all know Jack Unruh for his, yeah. uh, you know, some very wild things, editorial work that he did, but man, he was a big wildlife. Um, yes, he was. Did and fly phenomenal wildlife work, worked for field and stream all the time. Yep. Um, uh, he brought his interest of his life of fishing yeah. to it. And, you know, I think it's so important. I mean, I spend a lot of Dale Stefanos and I teach a portfolio class. Um, we spend a lot of time with that discussion. Uh, we're opening up a, uh, a, a commercial gallery track, uh, a whole set of classes that they're aimed at developing work, a uh, body of work that's appropriate for gallery, which is, uh, you know, um, you have to really consider, you have to really think sure. about, uh, do your research just like you would with illustration and um, has a lot of unique differences uh, from the right. illustration track. In your, um, I, I, and, I, and I've been meaning to bring this up, um, there was a major change for you to do all that book work. I mean, that is not, um, the children's, children's book work is like a satellite of the traditional illustration world. I mean, it has a, uh, it, they have their, their own agents, the, the way you approach agent and publisher or um, uh, yeah. you know, our art director and publisher are, uh, is, is, very, um, is so different and yeah. they have their own events. Maybe talk about that a little bit. Well, I mean, it was just something that evolved. I mean, when I was with, with Richard, I did do some children's books. And now explain and, that if that was your original, that, that was your agent. Yeah, my, with I, I had an agent Richard for Solomon. Long, yeah, I had an agent for a long, long time, Richard Solomon. And most of the work I did was editorial, but some jobs would come through when I would do them and they were fine. And, and my initial response when I got called to do a children's book, I didn't want to do it because when I was living in Texas, I had done a children's book and I will not mention the name of it. Some people have found it and say, oh, would you sign this? I'm going, oh, God, that 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 it was it was so awful, the experience that when I first got called to do a book, I said no, because I, the experience was so awful. And fortunately, the, the editor promised me that she would not behave that way. And she worked with me and things worked out. And so I started doing some, but I didn't want to do a lot of it because it's the pace of it is so different. I mean, the, I liken it to being, and you're an illustrator and, and you're doing editorial work. It's like being a sprinter, you know, constantly running a 50 yard sprint, a 50 yard sprint or a hundred yard sprint, whatever it may be, 200 yard dash. You get into a book. Now it's a marathon. 
And I mean, it's a different thing. And it, the, the preliminary work, the research work, all that stuff takes time and time and time. And trying to balance doing editorial work while you're doing a children's book and you're bouncing back and forth just, and then trying to manage your own family life, it, it was tough. And also at that time, I'm also teaching. So all of those things are all going on. And eventually um, I decided to really kind of step away from editorial work. If I didn't have a children's book I was working on, okay, I'll take on some editorial work. But I just really got um, physically tired of working till four o'clock in the morning. And then it, it used to be I could work till work all night long, get up the next day, I'd be fine go play golf or go play tennis, no big deal. But if I stayed up all night, it would, I would not be very good the next day and it would take me a little time to get over it. It just, your body just doesn't react well as you get older with these things. And so I just decided to focus only on children's books. And so- There's a question here that relating to children's book and I have a feeling that it's your negative experience was with working with the editor and the art director. But um, yeah, uh, but maybe you could explain that. Can you talk specifically about what was negative or unpleasant about your first children's book? Well, you know, when you first talk it over, you're working with them and you're talking about the book and ideas and kind of philosophy, how you want to do this thing. And, and what I was conscious of was, you know, how literal do you want me to illustrate from the text? I mean... Sometimes illustrating just, the only way I can describe it, it's like when somebody writes something and it's really well written and it's smartly done and the language is so clear. Why am I trying to illustrate the very same thing? The words are saying it so clearly, your mind sees the picture. All I'm doing now is repeating it. But if I take what you've described and imagined the scene that's in between those words and this word, these words over here, and then illustrated something in between that fills that gap, so to speak, where I didn't want to be illustrating exactly from the text. And they were going, exactly, that's exactly what we want. That's exactly what we want. <laughs> well, no, it wasn't what they wanted. And they wanted exactly from the text. And it, it got to the point where, I mean, you know, the hair on the mother's not right. We want the hair this way. We want this that way. We want this that way. We want this kind of, we want, to, I mean, I would send detailed drawings and I would get typewritten sheets back for every single illustration where there would be 27 changes on an illustration, 25 on this one, 22 on this one, 24 on that one. And you're just, and you're changing and you send it and they come back. And meanwhile, deadline doesn't change. We're not changing the deadlines. We have to make the deadlines. Right. So it ended up getting to the point where I mean, just to meet the deadlines. I mean, I, there were a couple, a number of times I, I pulled two all-nighters in a row. I mean, I got physically very, very sick. Um, afterwards where um you know i actually took myself into the emergency room because i thought i was passing a kidney stone or something i don't know what it was but i said this will never happen again it'll never happen again i will not do allow myself to be tortured this way and i was younger i mean i was i was in my 30s when i did this and it was just chris i, I had a very similar experience where it was just uh i quit i i at one point i just said i'm done here it's all you know we're caught up in payment here. You can have it back. And they convinced me to finish it, but I put it in a, but when I got everything back, I put it in a box and I swore I'd never show it to anybody. <laughs> and well, it, it, it was just, it, 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 I, there was three pieces. I, I liked the other, the other 14. I couldn't stand. Well, uh, the fun end against this was, so they called me to do a book, another book. And I said, absolutely not. I'm not going to do it. And they said, you find another illustrator. Oh, but we need you to, da, 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 da. I said, no, not going to do it. 
And so then a week later, they said, we got somebody who's going to do the inside. Will you do the cover? I said, no. I said, what do we want? And I, I said, okay, but I don't want to see all those changes. And he said, you tell me what you want. You tell me what you want. I will follow your instructions to the T. And then I want to see all those changes. Okay, we'll do that. We'll do that. So I do the drawing and in comes the type sheet of paper, 27 changes. 27. <laughs> and I'm like going, are you kidding me? I'm not doing it. I said, I'm sending it back. I'm not doing it. Get me out. I want out of this thing. I'm not going to do it. She said, please, you got to do it. And I said, I will do this. And I, I do remember, I said, I will do this one illustration under these conditions. And I said, what is that? That you promised me, you promised me, you never, ever call me on the telephone ever again. I don't even want to give you a voice. And that's how we finished it up. And then years later, I'm talking to one of these art director illustrator clubs down there at the Tri-Cities in, in North Carolina. And I run into, you remember the illustrator David got? Yes. I run into David and I'm telling the story and he goes, I did those jobs after you did. <laughs> and he said, it was the worst experience of my life. <laughs> It was the same thing. It was the, he said, I should have spoken to you. I wish I would have known ahead of time. They were the worst. That's funny. Oh, so, yeah. Well, um, can I go? We, have, we have about 10 more minutes, and okay. I, want to, I want to get through your slideshow. We're almost done. We are almost oh. done. Um, because all I wanted to do was talk, you know, uh, I started teaching when I was in Dallas, Texas. First started at a small uh, community college, Brookhaven College. And then I went to East Texas State, taught there for about four, three, four years. And when I moved back to Cincinnati, I started teaching at Columbus College of Art and Design, taught there. Uh, I'm not sure if it's 1997 to 2000. It's somewhere in that ballpark. But uh, I know I finished up in 2016. Loved the teaching. Um, I started teaching advanced illustration, but I found my, my real joy in teaching illustration was teaching the younger students particularly when I got into a drawing class because drawing is so important to me that, you know, I felt I really was able to make and help these kids draw better. And I totally enjoyed it. And then when Murray Tinkleman passed away, he uh, started the MFA program at Hartford. Um, I was asked to put my hat in the ring and they decided to hire me. And I've been teaching at, uh, not teaching, uh, managing the program since 2016 so that's essentially it do you want me to pop up the slide for the assignment or do you want to open up to questions first well it, it i i i'm going to explain it. it's 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 not an assignment it's a challenge that we give okay. to our audience okay and cool. and but what, i like how you referred to it at the assignment it if you choose to take it <laughs> is, is what we'll will the way we'll okay. uh, we'll we'll uh, frame that but um, it's mission yeah. impossible, Jim Phelps, if you choose yeah. to take this assignment on. We have a challenge that's due next week, and I hope people will contribute. Nobody is, is, has done it as posted yet, but we have a challenge due next week, uh, which we'll, Chris, you and I will take a look at before we talk okay. on, on, on next Monday night. Yep. Um, but this is, Chris and I talked about this, uh, and I think will be really fun, and I'll just kind of let you explain what we talked about. Okay. Well, this is to uh, do a portrait based, a U.S. postage stay portrait based on the state where you were born. So if you are born in the state of Indiana, you look and you find somebody famous from your state and you create a stamp based on that. Now, you have to use some of the criteria that the U.S. Postal Service has. For example, the person has to be dead for at least five years. Um, and that's just because you know, you do a, you know, the classic example for us in Ohio is Pete Rose. You know, Pete Rose is a great baseball player, but then he got kicked out of baseball. And so he, he, his, his, his legacy has been tarnished. You know, the Postal Service doesn't want tarnished uh, people on their, their stamps. So they get people who are long past five years dead and they've got clean records. And so they do this. Also, the size that you do your artwork cannot be more than 10 times the size of the actual stamp itself. So that means you can't do giant paintings because you do giant paintings, they don't translate well in something. This is, that I, this is a question I, I, we discussed here that I knew would come up is what if, what if you're not from the States? 
You're not from the United States. You live outside the country. That's that's fine. I mean, if you're from Switzerland, I mean, there's some famous people from Switzerland that I may not know if you're from, say, Tonga. I may not know all the history of Tonga, but you know your own history. If you're from another country, Bulgaria, I'm sure you 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 know your own history. Uh, so it's it's not imperative that I know who the history is. You know your own history. Your own citizens know your history as well. So if you choose uh, somebody, uh, that is the key. Is you, you, the real key is for this assignment is to do likeness, is to do a portrait. So that when you have a portrait of somebody in your portfolio, you can show that you can handle likeness. Being able to handle likeness and handle it well opens your, you up to the possibility of doing other jobs. You can do landscape, you do this, but if, if there's nothing in there that shows that you can handle likeness, that's a whole series of job opportunities that you may be passing up. And yeah, so, I talk about that in our, you know, our, our, so, our drawing frequently. It's yeah. like, the, the most important aspect of whatever, whatever whatever I'm doing with my drawing when we're doing famous people or drawing celebrities, um, it's got to look like the person. <laughs> and, 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 but if you also choose somebody that is so obscure and you, you go, well, you know, I want to do Bill Wickersham. Bill Wickersham was a pitcher who pitched in the major leagues, you know, for the Kansas City Royals for two years in baseball. Well, you know, your family may know Bill Wickersham because his family had an orchard down the next county. But nobody else knows who Bill Wickersham is because he was not, he's not Mickey Mantle, he's not Willie Mays, he's not Sandy Koufax, he's not Joe DiMaggio, he's Bill Wickersham. I, Bill Wickersham, the fact that he made it to the major leagues is congratulations, but he's not one of the great baseball players. I mean, there's there, a, a, a question that I have. Um, okay which I want you to answer it for everybody. And, and I, know, I know most of the answer, but um, there, there's no doubt. I mean, I, I, I always, when you're not in the room with me, I always refer to you as one of the best drawers that ever existed on the planet. And, um, and I, I think everybody I know that was around, that, that's been around that's drawn with you would say the same thing. Drawing is, your vocabulary, your voice has come from it. It's a big part of what you do, but, and I don't know if it was you doing those uh, pieces when you were in school, but how much, how much, how did you, how much design did you study? And uh, how much, uh, and, and, you know, you've applied this, the, your drawing to great design work and that's, you know, that's why I love you. That's why I love everything you do. Your landscapes, everything you do, it's so well composed. Well, it was. It really started, you know, because I wasn't a good designer. Because I was early on, you know, you just plop it in the middle. And Joe Cox, who was my teacher, you know, exposed me to to design. And then after the workshop, I was really exposed to design, and and that's when I really started to not just look at the design of illustrators, but look at the design of graphic designers, look at the design of architects, look at the design of industrial designers. I mean, whether it's Raymond Lowy, who was a great industrial designer, he designed the bullet train, he designed the Studebaker Hawk, he designed, I mean, Monty? appliances, he, Norman Bell Geddes, the, the designs of his work, architecture, you know, uh, Stanley Bell, uh, Stan, uh, Chesley Bonestell, excuse me, great architect. He's the guy who designed the Eagles on the Chrysler building, but he was also a great illustrator. And you start looking at those folks. And once again, that's where you do. It's, you know, there was a photographer, great photographer. I think it was Edward Steich and somebody was saying, well, what's that? What's a big deal about being a photographer? I mean, maybe Tim, Tim would understand this. Somebody says, gee whiz, you snap enough pictures, you're bound to get a good one. <laughs> and 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 I, I Steichen, I think it was. He goes, yeah, but isn't it funny how always certain photographers always get it? They get a lot more good ones. <laughs> yeah, they, they always they're the ones who always get it. Yeah, everyone every now and then, like I took a bunch of picture at my son's wedding. I shot a shot that's a great shot, but the other hundred and sixty five pictures I took now aren't. I got lucky on one of them, but if a, a professional photographer who really knows what they're doing, they'll get a lot of. Them. 
all the all the things that you uh, you mentioned, the one that you probably looked at more than anybody I know as an artist that have taken from is the cinematographers. Oh, uh, no doubt. I mean, you know, uh, you're absolutely right. Um, and you know, James Wong Howe, who was a great one. I'm trying to think. Uh, Jack Cardiff, who did uh, Black Dahlia. I mean, what what's the other one? Did I think it was Black Dahlia, and then. Um, trying to think of the other one Greg Tolan who who did I think he did Citizen Kane and Dead End and some of the great great uh films uh, and directors I'm, I'm not sure who who was the cinematographer I think one of my favorite movies and I've shown you know I've taken shots of it is uh David Lean's uh Great Expectations right. the pictures in that John Ford always had great cinematographers is a cinematographer for how green was my valley just watch that film it's it's like paintings coming to life they're just so beautifully right. composed you know so um yeah. what i'm going to tell everybody is because they're asking other questions this is going to be really basically what we've said but i'll put all the details and we'll post the challenge in the next couple of days i'll put it in the in the in the challenge um uh channel and um we, you know, we can talk about it if you have questions about it while Chris is working with us for the for the month. Uh, it would be fun to talk about. Um, Chris, this was a great first night, and I'm just excited that we have three more. And um, does everybody... anybody have a last question? Does anybody have a last question? Um, I, I, I think the one I asked uh you know about the design i wanted it to be the last question <laughs> because i wanted i want people to think about the you know this this stamp be a stamp is a really small thing and i mean it's it's it, uh, composition is going to be so important your light and dark pattern of your abstract shapes that you bring to this picture are going to be so important to this piece um so employee design well, and, and the last thing to do with that is, is just understand the design of the thing that you're drawing is, yeah, that, we understand that's really important, but the design of the shape that's behind it, the negative spaces, those right. negative spaces are shapes, and you want those shapes to be of every bit as interesting as the shapes of the objects that you're painting. Keep that in mind. Good. Well, well said. All right, Chris, thank you for a great night. Everybody have a have a wonderful week. We'll see you next week. We'll see you next Monday night. All right, man. Thanks so much, guys. Thank you, Chris. Take care.